We're in Psalm 47, the 47th Psalm. And as we consider leading the nations, as we consider what kind of ecclesia God is looking for, what kind of people he wants us to be, this psalm speaks so powerfully into that blueprint that God has, the concept, the template that God has, the idea, the plan that God has for his ecclesia. It's right here because in order to build God's ecclesia, you have to have a true concept, a true idea, a true vision, a true revelation of who he really is. Not diluted down, not a a religious idea, but a Holy Ghost, Word of God idea. And here it is here. In Psalm 47, it says, Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. We need to be hand clapping people. You know, we need to be people that clap our hands, but not just clap our hands to sing along, but clap our hands with a note of victory. Notice it doesn't say here uh, to whisper unto God, but it says to shout unto him. With the voice of triumph. You see, too many people have the voice of misery, the voice of defeat, the voice of failure. And particularly in this uh, present crisis, people are all talking about, oh, well, what the the devil's going to do, what Bill Gates is going to do, what evil governments are going to do, what uh, the UN wants to do. Let's talk about the triumph that God has for us. God has called you to victory, not to defeat. God has called you to success, not failure. God has called you to triumph, not misery. So we need to be people with a voice of triumph. Amen. Then it says, it gives us the reason. For the Lord Most High is terrible. You know, we serve a terrible God. Did you know that? The Bible says we do. The Lord Most High. El Elyon. Yahweh Elyon is terrible. He's a terrible God. Now, that doesn't mean terrible as in, you know, he's, he's not worth anything. It means terrible as in awesome. In fact, the New King James translates it as awesome. But you could go deeper than that and say he's a frightening God. A lot of things you could be scared about in planet Earth right now. But the thing you need to be scared of, the thing you need to be uh, afraid of, the thing you need to fear is God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom by humility. And the fear of the Lord are riches and honour and life or revival. There's a right kind of fear. There's a wrong kind of fear. The wrong kind of fear is to fear the devil, to fear a virus to fear death. And the Bible says that if you fear death, then you're subject to bondage. In other words, you're in captivity. You're in lockdown if you fear death. The lockdown's not out there, and it's not just keeping you in your house. Your heart is locked down when you fear death. So fear the Lord. It's the only kind of fear that is liberating, that is life-giving, and that leads to blessing. And it says he's a great king over all the earth. Now, we we're going to get into it deeper in this psalm, but I want to say this to you. The devil isn't the king over all the earth. And uh, Bill Gates isn't the king over all the earth. And neither is any other human personage. God is the great king over all the earth. And, and God's earthly throne of dominion is, of course, the throne of David. But he is the great king over all the earth. And we need to start understanding when we sing about God being king, when we sing about Jesus being king, not just nice thoughts or nice sentiments, it's spiritual reality. It's spiritual reality that he reigns. Then it says, he shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. Verse 3. We need that kind of preaching, friends. We need to hear that God is subduing people and nations under us, not that we're going to be trampled upon or that we're going to be messed around or that we're going to be the devil's punch bag or that we're going to be 
uh, you know, herded up like cattle and given the choice between the vaccine or death. We need to stop listening to stuff like that and understand the template of God we win. And we're on top. We're the head, not the tail. We're above only and never beneath. We need to start understanding things like this. Are the things that God wants us to see in his word? Yeah, of course, they're going to try it on. Of course, the devil and his cohorts. Of course, evil people are going to try and keep, suppress the church and subdue us. But it's not going to happen if we pray, if we believe, if we proclaim, if we take our place as the ecclesia of God. That's what has to happen right now. We need to take our place. We need to be the people of God at this time. We need to be a faithful people. But we also need to be a people filled with faith, not a people filled with fear. He will subdue the peoples under us. He will put nations under our feet. You can, you can see that over in Isaiah 60, Revelation chapter 3, where it speaks about the Philadelphia church, that they'll come and prostrate themselves at our feet. This is reality. And you know, it all depends on what you believe. Do you believe that we are here to be trodden over, trampled on, or do you believe that we are here to see the people of this earth subdued under us? It's not that we go about haughty or arrogant. arrogant. I don't mean that. I'm not talking about being arrogant and conceited and, you know, we're the people of God. I don't mean it like that. It's God that puts them under our feet anyway. Remember in Psalm 89, it says about David he, that, that he'll, sub, he'll beat down the foes of David before his face. That's what I'm talking about. That people recognize Yahweh in us. People recognize Christ is in us, the hope of glory. We're seen, Isaiah 60, Arise, shine, for thy light has come, the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. When, when people see the glory, they'll, when people see the authentic glory, it drives them to their knees. And it's time that the glory was, was shining through us. It's time that the glory was rising upon us. Oh, praise his glorious name. Then it says, he shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved, Salah. That features into Revelation chapter 3. Um, that people will recognize that we are Zion. People will recognize that we are God's uh, inheritors. Jacob have I loved. Esau have I hated. Oh, there's some deep mysteries in here, and I don't really have the time and the scope right now to get into these things. But trust me, if you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ, then and you are his beloved, then he'll show who is loved and who is hated. But only again, as I said, if you exercise faith, that you pray these things through, that you get serious about these matters. Stop playing shallow games. Stop playing uh, kiddie on church and toy town church. This is real. And one thing this coronavirus thing that's hit the earth ought to be teaching us is we need to get real with God. We need to get serious. We need to mature. We need to be people who are no longer uh, satisfied with the things that of childish toys. We need to be people that mature in him. Then it says, God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. God has gone up with a shout, a lot of, there's a lot of shouting in here and blowing trumpets. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Start understanding and realizing what, what this is all about. This is God saying, my people, my ecclesia, my, the gates of hell will not prevail against my legislative governmental assembly, which is what the word church in Greek, ecclesia, really means the legislative parliamentary governmental assembly the council of god are you part of the council or are you part of a little happy clappy you know um holy huddle 
Or are you part of the governing body that God has raised up in the earth to govern matters? To be closer to him even than kings and leaders of nations, unless those kings and leaders of nations are also his people. It's time we start getting serious about this. We're not here to make up the numbers. We're not here to have little religious pie-in-the-sky ideas about the kingdom. We're here to enforce the kingdom, to plant the kingdom, to lay a new foundation on the earth. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises unto our king, sing praises. Praise is a big part of it. Remember in Psalm 149, it speaks about the high praises of God in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. We need to be people who vocalise our faith, vocalise what we're about, Voc- speak it out and sing it out and shout it out and be people who are vocal about our faith. We're not just little sitting there quietly and reflective and that's part of things. You know, there's a time to be still and silent and, and quiet and it's very important that we do that at times because sometimes we just shoot off our mouth. But when it comes time to speak our faith, when it comes time to have the, the note of triumph, when it comes time to speak victory, then we need to be people that will speak it, sing it, and not be silenced. I think a big part of what's going on right now is that people want to silence the church. They don't want to. And, and I've read stuff online about, well, you can meet, but you can't sing, because sing will spread a virus. My God. How dumb do they think we are? We've got to start realising that the agenda of people who are anti-Christ, you know, that's their agenda. They're anti what we're about. They're against, they're in opposition to us. So we need to start taking authority and dominion and having these people subdued under us. It's not about subduing the people so much as subduing the ideologies and the spirit and the principality that are behind these people. But that, that effectively means that we, we have to subdue the people. But it's, we're not in this for that power trip. We're in it because it's essential that God's kingdom be enforced on the earth. Then he says this, verse 7. And this is, this is, this is a little bit of the meat of this that I want to get into. It says, for God is the king of all the earth. He's not the king of America. He's not the king of Britain. He's not the king of what we would call Christian nations and I don't know that there are too many of them to find right now. He's the king of all the earth. So even those places that are that are really got darkness going on and that really have a hostile environment and atmosphere against the body of Christ, against God's kingdom, against the ecclesia, even those places he's king there too. And you know, you know how God becomes king of a country, a nation, a territory? When his people declare him to be it. You know, the Bible says that if you declare Jesus as Lord, then you'll be saved. Now that's not just to get people born again. That is also a weapon, an instrument of dominion that people can use. We can use it corporately as churches, as communities, as the ecclesia in a nation to declare the lordship of Christ and salvation comes. Salvation is not just you get born again, you don't go to hell when you die. Salvation is that the kingdom gets ushered in, that blessings start to abound, that you start to live in a whole new paradigm and dimension of living, which is one of blessing, glory, light, life, liberty, uh, healing, miracles, provision, prosperity, superabundance. That is salvation. It's a temporal thing as well in that it can manifest in the temporal sphere. It's not just, oh well, you know, you'll have eternal life, you'll, you'll go to Jesus when you die. It's not about that alone. It's also about how we live now. Not as curs, wretches, miserable beggars, but as the people of God exercising dominion. Yeah, okay, people have suffered, been persecuted. Uh, people have lived miserable lives because they, they suffer for their faith. We know all that. They suffered the contradiction because, you know, you put this stuff out there, you're going to get blowback. You're going to get people kicking against it. You're going to get the, the devils are going to try and stir up rebellion. But it's still truth. And we still have to proclaim it. And we still have to walk in it. And we still have to exercise faith. 
for a season, a generation, a time, and, and that be an ongoing thing. And, you know, if, if it has to be that Jesus has to come back to, to make it happen, fine. But, you know, we can walk in this. We've got the Holy Ghost. We've got our, our Bibles. You know, we, we, can, we can take this planet for Jesus. We can certainly take nations and territories. So he's a king over all the earth. And this is a bit here that says, Sing ye praises with understanding. You know, very often we just get to church and hallelujah, Jesus is Lord. Yes, God's a great king. Oh, you know, praise the Lord. But we don't do it with understanding. You could say this another way, sing you praises with intentionality. I like that word. You hear me use that a lot in my message because it's just such a mm. intentionality means you singing and you know what you're singing about. You're not just singing it because somebody else is singing it or because this is the time in the, the, the meeting that we sing, you're singing it to proclaim it and to plant the kingdom and to intentionally bring heaven's atmosphere into where you are and into where you live and into where you have community. So you sing these praises, understanding what they mean. Uh, very often if I'm... Uh, leading corporate uh, the Lord's Prayer, I, I'll, I'll start by saying, we're not saying this at a ritual. You know, you know, Daddy, Daddy, Our Father, which art in heaven, la, 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 la. We're saying it as a prayer, not just, this is where we say the Lord's Prayer. And, you know, we, we, we just uh, recite it by rote or ritual. No, we're saying it as if, oh, wow, I just realized what this prayer can do. It can transform atmospheres. It can change spiritual conditions in a city, in a town, in a village, in a street, in my home, in my life. And so sing praises with understanding. Pray with understanding. Do the stuff that we do do, but with understanding, with intentionality. And as it says, God is to be worshipped in spirit and in truth, not just by you know, well, this is this is the point in the service where we say these things. No. Do it, we understand it. And then I like this next verse. Wow. This is what it's all about. It says, God reigneth. You know, sometimes it just sounds so much better than the King James, doesn't it? God reigneth over the heathen. <laughs> now, that's, a, that's an old-fashioned word, the heathen. Uh, but the actual Greek, the, the Hebrew word just simply means nations. Okay, so God reigneth over the nations. He reigns over the whole earth. He reigns over the Bible. It tells us here in the, psalm, the same psalm. Um, he, he reigns over the whole earth. He's the king of all the earth. The previous verse, then it says, God reigneth over the heathen, over the nations. So why are we worried about nations? Or their rulers? Why are we worried what's out there? Why are we worried about China and North Korea? And other places that, you know, the media would have us believe are places to be feared. And some politicians. Well, God reigns over them. God can do something in a nation in a day that can change that nation forever. We need to start believing that and start praying to a God like that. Because we pray, we whine sometimes in our voice. And, and almost as if, well, this is a hard job for you, Lord. I know you might have to go to work on this and you, you know, this might really stretch you. Is anything too hard for the God who reigns over all the earth? The God who created it in the first place and everybody on it? God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. Now, some of the modern translations will say God sits on his holy throne. And that's true. That that's I just like this phrase. God sitteth. Upon the throne of his holiness. Again, the King James just puts it in a whole different uh, dimension of truth. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. There are levels of truth in this that I, I don't necessarily want to get into too much, just to say that uh, there's a truth here that. Many of the royal houses in Europe, um, and in fact, if you study the lives of the presidents of America, you'll see that 
many of the uh, world leaders, uh, kings, and, and even, as I said, the presidents of America, they actually descend from Abraham, they descend from King David, um, the Davidic dynasty of the British royal house, and indeed the European royal families, well documented. And of course, it's also true that I think most of, if not all of the American presidents can trace their family back to uh, the, the house of David as well. And so the shields, that could be the royal arms and emblems and so on, um, what it's really saying is, is that God has strategically placed people in leadership and rulership that, that can trace descent back to Abraham and, as I said, to King David. That's, that's, a, you know, we, that, that's another message uh, in, in terms of going off in a, a direction that we're not really looking at right now, which is how this impact, although that's a big part of it, we, we can't rule it out. I'm simply saying that we don't have time to get into that particular verse too much. God reigns, is the, the point I'm trying to get across right now. He reigns over the nations. He reigns over nations and their rulers. And um, as I said, there, there's, there are reasons for that. But I'm, I'm trying to throw it back to us again and go back to a theme you've probably heard me speak on many, many times, the necessity of praying for nations or people and their rulers. You pray for nations, you pray for people by praying for the rulers. Why? Because rulers of nations are gatekeepers to their community. And if you can influence them, either by prayer or if you have personal interaction or both, or they hear you preach or whatever, in other words, influencing leaders before the throne of God, before uh, the throne, the heavenly throne of the Father with Jesus at his right hand, uh, by influencing through prayer, the king's heart is turned. But we need to understand this. It's God who's in control. You know, and, and we sing that old uh, chorus, God is still on the throne, all that stuff. Um, and and, and there's, it's true. But we need to do it with understanding. In other words, it's not just, yeah, God's, God's in control, God's on the throne. We, we need to study it. You can't have understanding of something without two things that are important, and they go together, which is uh, revelation and study. So study these matters. This isn't the only psalm that speaks about Yahweh reigning over the earth. But when you understand that he does, when you see from the word that he does, when it's revealed to your heart that he does, that ought to change your prayer life unless you're already praying good prayers and praying bullseye prayers and praying on point. And if you're not, then you need to get into this to see it because if all your prayers are swollen and bawling or, oh Lord, uh, here comes the Antichrist, come and deliver us. If that's all, if that's your level, you need to get out of that level and get into maturity. So God reigns, clap your hands, have a shout and a note of triumph in your voice because revival, reformation, restoration of all things, the great end time, Elijah awakening out, pouring all the things, different names for it that we see in scripture and that we, we hear in our, our hearts and that prophets are speaking of and that many are preparing for. We need to be ready in position for revival. That's the message. Psalm 47 positions us by changing the paradigm of our thinking from one of defeat to victory. And we need to walk in victory. Victory is our portion. God always causes us to triumph in Christ. Uh, to be basic about it, read the end of the book, we win. Uh, but we've already won. We're not being led to victory. We're being led from victory to victory. In other words, from a place of victory in Christ to a place of manifested victory here on the earth as God's kingdom, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Here's the good news. He's reigning through you and I. He's not going to reign on his own. He's going to reign in a co-regency relationship with you and I. And, and it's so close that he says, as he is, so are we. 
that is so close that he we, that he is uh, one spirit with the Lord. We're, we're joined to the Lord. We're one spirit with him. Christ is in us, the hope of glory. You see, uh, today's Pentecost. And um, Jesus, when he came as a babe, was Emmanuel, God with us on the cross. He was God for us. And now, in this era, this dispensation, and Pentecost is a great way to remember that he's God in us. He's the hope of glory in us. So let's release him in our lives so that we can walk in the reality of this and see God reigning over the nations through the agency and ministry of his people in his ecclesia. That's you and I. The Lord bless you.